Hi, this is Braden Holpe. Hey, this is Tanner the Bulldozer Bozer. Hi, this is Brian Burke from Toronto, Ontario. This is Daryl Sutter. Hello, everyone. I'm Carly Agro from Sportsnet Central. This is Jay Onright. This is Quick Dick Quick Dick coming to you from Tufnell, Saskatchewan. Hey, everybody. My name is Steel Fleury. This is Kelly Rudy. This is Corey Cross. This is Wade Redden. This is Jordan Tutu. My name is Jim Patterson. Hey, it's Ron McLean, Hockey Net in Canada and Rogers Hometown Hockey, and welcome to the Sean Newman Podcast. Let's get on to our T-Bar 1 Tale of the Tape. Originally from Foam Lake, Saskatchewan, he stands at 5'6". He was taken in the 1973 NHL entry draft, selected in the 8th round, 118th overall by the Detroit Red Wings. Through his career, he played 390 games in the NHL, all for the Red Wings. He scored 59 goals, 82 assists for 141 points, with 1,242 penalty minutes. He wore the C for the Red Wings and spent 14 years pro between the NHL and AHL. One of the big things that Polonich is remembered for is on October 25th, 1978, uh, he got under the skin of Colorado Rockies' Wilf Paymont, and what has been termed as the worst ever case of brutality in the NHL, Paymont smashed his stick across uh, Polonich's face and leaving him with a concussion, severe face lacerations, and a broken nose requiring reconstructive surgery. Back then, Polonich sued and was awarded a settlement of $850,000 back in 1982. Yes, I'm talking about Dennis Polonich. The table has been set. Let's get on to the main course. My name is Dennis Polonich, and I'd like to welcome you to the Sean Newman Podcast. Welcome to the Sean Newman Podcast. Tonight I'm joined by Dennis Polonich. So thank you. Polonich, yeah. <laughs> so thanks for thanks for hopping on. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Now I know you uh, you to our mutual friend uh, uh that's, that's right, old Dean. I appreciate him yeah. uh him hooking us up here. Um, you know, you keep telling me we're not gonna have anything to talk about. I laugh about that because <laughs> You know, the more I dig on you, I just keep thinking to myself, you know, all my life, I've always been told if you were a few inches taller, you would have went uh, further. You would have made the NHL. And here you are, five foot six. I would have loved to have watched you back in your heyday. You're my size and you you spent a good part of your career um, playing for the red and white. So I think this is going to be super cool. I really appreciate you hopping on. Uh, thank you. And, and, uh, you're right. You know, as we get older here now, I'll be 67 in December. Um, you know, the last 10 or 15, 20 years, you get to appreciate your life more than, than when you were 30 or 40 years old. You kind of took things for granted. And uh, there's no question for coming from a small town, Saskatchewan, being a little guy, uh, I, I bucked a lot of odds and uh, I've had an interesting life. Bucked a lot of odds is, is bang on. I mean, how many people did you hear when you were five, six that, yeah, you're going nowhere, Dennis? Well, I just, I had, a, I, I get asked that question all the time. Like, how, you know, they look at me, how can a little guy like you, how can you be so tough? How, how can you have played? Uh, I can't explain it other than the fact that I just, I didn't care. Like if I lost, I lost. If I won, then it was a feather in my cap because everybody was bigger than I was. But uh, I had a lot of good mentorship and, and a lot of good direction when I was young. And Patty Janelle really molded me in, in Flin Flon in two years uh, to become the player that, that I became. And then uh, Doug Barkley uh, and Al Coates had a lot of influence uh, uh, in the minor league in the first couple of years uh, before I made it to Detroit. So, you know, I, uh, I, was, I was one of those fortunate guys uh, growing up on a farm. I knew how to work. And, uh, and I knew how to listen. And uh, I think that's a, that was a, the biggest attribute I had. I listened and I learned. Yeah, well, it, listening is definitely an art. Uh, and a lot of people don't give it enough credit. Yeah, you, and, uh, you know, focus. You got to have all the intangibles. I coached uh, up until just recently. I, I've done a lot of coaching throughout my life and, and uh, mentored a lot of kids in that. And it, was, it wasn't about making the NHL and that. It was just 
trying to teach them to be good citizens for later on in life. And a lot of them thank me now. They, they got good jobs and they're still playing hockey, you play hockey for the rest of your life. But uh, they, they may not be making a living playing hockey, but they got good jobs and they're solid citizens, they're good family people. And uh, it's really heartwarming when, uh, when I cross paths with them uh, now. Well, I think being on a hockey team um, and being a good teammate teaches you a lot about the outside world, whether you believe it at the time or not. And tons of hockey players, myself included, once you get into the business world, a lot of those skills that our coaches are trying to hammer into our young minds, and sometimes we take it and sometimes we don't, really do translate into the business world where you're a different type of team. Well, trust me, I got, I got five grandkids now. And, uh, you know, my daughters are athletes. So, you know, the, the, the kids are going to be athletes as well. And uh, I told my both daughters, I said, uh, grandma and grandpa aren't raising them. But uh, I can tell you, I'm going to have uh, uh, a say in whether they play sports or not. And they're going to play sports. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, you mentioned uh, you don't know how you're so tough, but I think being a small guy, you you, you got one of two choices: you you fade away, or you dive in. And like, I mean, being the small guy, you don't have any choice, right? Like, I don't think you do. You gotta. No, you're you're correct. You got to stand up for yourself, um, and certainly it's your upbringing. You know, uh, we didn't. There was five kids in a two bedroom house out on the farm and uh, you learn very quickly that the first one up gets is going to be the best dressed. <laughs> <laughs> um, five kids, two parents and a two bedroom house. That must've been nice, tight living. Uh, we got by, we never went hungry. And uh, like I said, it was a, uh, it was, it was good upbringing. I'd read uh, a little bit up on you and, and back oh. in that time, um, my father is roughly your age, actually a year younger than you. And he played senior for Helmond back when he was in his teens and, uh, reading up on you, you got to play for the foam Lake flyers when you were 15, 16. Well, I, again, that was huge because, uh, I went to uh, Saskatoon. My brother was a newlywed, uh, living in Saskatoon and I tried out for the blades and, uh, Jackie McLeod was a coach there and I didn't make the, the, the big junior team, but they wanted me to stay in Saskatoon and play for the junior B team and they would affiliate me, but we didn't have any money and uh, I wasn't going to room and board and, and school and that with, uh, with my newlywed brother. So I went back to Foam Lake and uh, lo and behold, I played senior hockey. I played juvenile hockey. I played midget hockey. I just, I lived at the rink and the two years I played senior hockey really developed me because you keep your head up you're playing against men and you need to learn how to compete and fight for the puck and so forth so that was uh, again that was huge in my development i'm curious in that senior league were you as feisty as you were um at the the other levels you played well we had a, a tremendous uh hockey player in foam league by the name of harold sandberg and he was a big six foot two six foot four centerman and it was my job to go and dig the puck out and give it to him in the slot and uh, and he would score <laughs> at will but uh no, I, I didn't do much scrapping obviously at 15 16 years old but uh, i sure you know you learn how to compete and and again you, you know nobody's going to bully me uh, uh you know you're going to stand, stand up for yourself you head to Flin Flon, and I think, you know, in all of Canada, there's very few places like the Flin Flon Bombers in hockey lore. Um, what was it that attracted you to go that way instead of maybe going back to Saskatoon? Well, back then there was no protected lists uh, or, or, or any drafts or anything in junior. So uh, uh, Flin Flon had a goalie by the name of Herman Hordell, and he lived in Winyard, Saskatchewan, which is 30 miles from Foam Lake. So I seen Herman in the summertime and he said, uh, Polo, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm going to play. I'm going to try out for junior somewhere. And, and he said, well, why don't you come to Flim Flon? So he told Patty Janelle and Patty Janelle sent me an invite. So I got the invite. But we didn't have a phone on the farm. So I phoned Patty Janelle from my grandma's house because I was concerned I didn't have good skates. I never had a pair of CCM tacks. I just had some Black Panthers from 
the catalog or whatever, and they were they were breaking down. But I didn't want to sound cocky and ask them on the phone, Mr. Janelle, if I make the team, are you going to buy me equipment or are you going to buy me skates? So I, I said to him, I said, Mr. Janelle, what kind of skates should I bring? And there was silence. He didn't understand the question, obviously. So after about a few seconds, Sonny, bring the fastest ones you got. <laughs> So, so anyways, I loaded up, went up to Flin Flon on a bus with, uh, with my old skates and uh, made the team. And he took, personally took me across the main street to a hardware store and uh, bought me my first pair of tack skates. What did you think of the first set of tack skates? I, I might have slept with them <laughs> the first couple of nights. <laughs> I, was, I was pretty... I was pretty, uh, pretty proud, pretty happy. It was a big, it was a big moment. What did you think of playing in Flin Flon? You got to play there a couple of years. Well, I, again, like uh, um, when I was fifteen or sixteen, Moose Jaw picked me up, and I played with Clark Gillies. By the way, okay, uh, we ended up winning Saskatchewan Provincials, uh, which was a big deal um, back then, and uh, and then and I won Most Gentlemanly Player. You won most gentlemen. I won most gentlemanly player when I played midget hockey in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. And then I go to Flin Flon and Patty Janelle molds me into this, what I became. And uh, I remember uh, at practice one day, I'd never blocked a shot in my life. Uh, so the defenseman, we were scrimmaging or we had a drill and the defenseman wound up to take a shot. So I went down to block the shot and I got it right in my gut back then the, shin, the the shoulder pads and the equipment wasn't like it is today so it knocked the wind out of me and I thought well be damned like I can't stay down on the ice so I gather myself get up to there and I, <gasps> I can barely breathe like can't get my breath and I skated by him and he and he says that a boy Sonny and I thought good <laughs> he noticed <laughs> you know again he seen my tenacity and and stuff and just little things like that and uh, yeah when I Went up to Flin Flon, I thought, wow, like, talk about growing up fast. Yeah, well, and, you're, on, you're on your own in the middle of nowhere. And I exactly, mean that in the highest sense yeah. of all for Flin Flon. Yeah, and, and then, uh, you know, once, uh, you know, there's no way I wanted to get caught or go back home. Like, what am I going to tell my friends, you know, that, that I didn't make the team? So, you know, I made the team. And then once you make the team, you had a choice. You could go to school or you could work in the mine. Well, <laughs> again, there was nobody giving me any direction. So, so most of the guys quit school and worked in the mine and made like eight or 900 or a thousand dollars a month back in 1973, 74. So, so that's what we did. We worked in the mine from eight till 12. You're telling me while playing for the bombers, 18, instead, 19, of, instead of going to school, you went, ah, screw it. Let's go work in the mine. Yeah. Yeah, majority of the players did that. 80% of the players worked in the mine and uh, had made and got paid. You could never do that today with, uh, with the unions and that, but we'd work in the, in the mine 8 to eight to 12 and practice at 1.30, and we'd get a paycheck, a full paycheck every two weeks and paid our room and board out of there. Went, I think I paid $105 the first year, and I think she upped it the next year to, to $115 or 120 and I thought, oh, my God, like... But yeah, so you learn quickly how, again, you grow up fast and you learn how to manage money. And So you were paying for your own room and board in Flint Flon as well? Yes, because we worked in the mine, yeah. No yeah. kidding. That's, that's unbelievable. I mean, that's, that's super cool. $105 a month and we ate like kings. <laughs> <laughs> I, had a, I had a great billet. Who, is, who, who did you billet with, uh, Dennis? Mrs. Peters, I can't, I, I can't remember. Agnes, I think. I think it was Agnes Peters. And she had hockey. She didn't have a big house, but we had the whole upstairs. She had two bedrooms up, upstairs. And uh, she had hockey players for years. And I can remember eating, you know, her, her cooking pork chops or whatever. And you didn't just get one or two. Like, you could eat as many as you wanted. Like she, was, she was unreal. And her husband worked in the mine. And uh, obviously, she was uh, a homebody. And uh, yeah, was 
How about, uh, you know, going back that, um, back to those days, you know, all kids just think of hopping on the bus and away you went. I've heard different stories of, uh, um, the different bus trips, uh, teams had taken, but Flin Flon being that far out there and playing different, um, while you're playing the Saskatoons of the world, the Regina's, the Edmonton's, I mean, you guys had a lot of road trips. What oh, was... God. When we went on, on road trips, Sean, we'd go for two weeks. We'd go, we'd start like Saskatoon, Regina, and then you'd come out Calgary Centennials, uh, New Westminster Bruins. Um, yeah. So you were gone like two weeks at a time. Our closest trip was Winnipeg. Winnipeg, yeah. that's right. Yeah, yeah Winnipeg, Winnipeg uh, or Brandon, you know. But, uh, and sorry, I guess Saskatoon, but yeah, you spent a lot of hours on the bus. What? <laughs> What are your fondest memories of being back on that bus with the teammates? Well, you know what? I got to learn how to sleep anywhere. I can, I can doze off on, on a recliner or a couch or on an airplane or in my office if I put my feet up or whatever. Like, I have no problem taking a 10-minute or 15-minute nap, 15 minute nap. You know, you th- th- I was one of the smaller guys. I, I, uh, I recruited Zdeno Chair to play in the Prince George, with the Prince George Cougars. And... Uh, you can imagine him riding on the bus when, when it was time to nap, he'd lay down a piece of foam in the, in the in, middle of the aisle, in the, in the middle of the aisle and stretch out there. Us little guys, you just curl up on the seat. And, yeah. We can sleep anywhere. That's one of the, <laughs> the glorious things about being short. Yeah. How did you wait? So you recruited Zidane Char? Yeah. I, when I, uh, I played pro for 14 years and yeah. when I finished, when I finished pro, I, my first job was in Yorkton, Saskatchewan, Saskatchewan Junior League. And again, I, uh, I had to do it all back then. You had to sell season tickets. You had to sell advertising. You recruited players. I didn't have like three or four. I didn't have a major staff. And, uh, you know, when you play hockey, I played hockey for 14 years. I didn't know how to put together a, a, an invite, a player invite or a letter. You know, if I had to go to or speak, you know, to the to the uh, commerce or, or, you know, some group in in uh, in uh, Yorkton about, you know, so again, you got to re-educate yourself. And uh, so then from Yorkton, I went to Medicine Hat for four years, uh, managed the, the Tigers. And then from there, I went to Prince George and uh, they have the, the European the import draft and major juniors, you know. Uh, and, and each team has allowed two players. And I had Zidane O'Chair on my list. I'd never seen him play. Obviously, we didn't have the, the financial uh, weather all to, to scout in Europe. So I just I had him on a list from a player agent or someone. So the NHL draft, Mike Milbury drafted him in the third round but for the New York Islanders. So I immediately phoned Mike Milbury and I said, Mike, I said, you drafted Zidane O'Chair our draft is coming up. And I said, I'd like to take him. Do you think he'd come to North America to play? Oh yes, Polo, we, you know, we'd love that. Get him acclimatized and, and stuff. And I thought, well, if he's good enough to get drafted in the third round by the, by the NHL team, he's good enough to play junior. So I took it, I called him and I said, uh, Zdeno, I said, Dennis Blonich here. He didn't know who I was, but but I said, I'm a general manager of a major junior team, Prince George. And I called Mike Milbury and I want to draft you and bring you to Canada to play junior. He says, yes, I come. <laughs> so that's all I needed to hear. So I drafted him and, uh, and then the wheels were in motion. I flew him in and, you know, he came to Prince George. At that time, he was six foot five and about 214 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe less than 200. He was just a tall, gangly, skinny guy. And, uh, you know, obviously a little bit awkward, but you could see his, you know, his passion and his commitment and everything. And, and uh, yeah, and we became, we're friends to this day. Uh, I can, I will tell you some neat stories about Zidano. So do you want me to go on? Absolutely. Okay. Um, so he played junior with us and, and, you know, he was tremendous in the weight room and just, you know, did all he could to make himself better all the time, uh, was tremendous to be around. So at Christmas time, the Canadian kids get to go home because you have a four or five day break. 
Well, the European kids can't because by the time you fly them there and back, that's two days. You know, there's no time. There's no time. There's no time. Yeah. So I had Zidano and another kid by the name of Ronald Petrovicki come to our house for Christmas. And we treated them like our family. And we bought them gifts. and, And my girls were, you know, 10 years old at the time. And eight years old or whatever. So they were playing with Zidano and, and, and uh, Petrovicki. We exchanged gifts and we drank wine and, and we had Christmas dinner and stuff. And they really thought that was something, became part of the family. Well, lo and behold, Zidano became the player that he became and he's playing in Boston. My one daughter ended up going to school in Hartford, Connecticut on a squash scholarship at Trinity. So she won it. Squash. She was a Canadian champion. And uh, yeah. And uh, so she goes to Trinity on a, on a scholarship, becomes captain of the team and said, Dad, I want to take the girls to Boston to a Bruins game on the train and then come back, you know, as a team bonding thing. Can you help me with tickets? I said, yeah, let's call Zidano. So I called Zidano. And instead of me going third person I just said you know talk directly to Loran and she'll he freed up his box and had all the girls in Z's corner watch the game and that and all the food drinks and then and then he sent up a an usher and took him down to the wives lounge and they waited for him after the game so he signed all their paraphernalia and that so I said Zidano I said let me you know pay for like tickets or drinks or you know, or food or whatever. No, Dennis, remember when you buy me jacket? When he came to <laughs> Prince George, he didn't have any winter clothes. So I took him out with my family. I had the team credit card and bought him a winter jacket and a shirt and tie, you know, some clothes and stuff. And he remembered that. That's the kind of guy he is. He says, no, no, you don't owe me anything. He said, remember when you buy me jacket? So that was, that was pretty special another time whenever he comes to calgary here we always go for lunch when they have they usually have a day off or a morning skate or whatever so i pick him up and he doesn't want to go to restaurants because people you know he's in restaurants all the time and he isn't he wants privacy so i said what do you want to eat like you come to my place i'll barbecue i don't know if you want because i know how fussy they are so i don't know if he wants chicken or steak or fish or seafood or whatever so he's no we have steak so i went and bought nice 14 ounce prime rib or uh, I'm sorry ribeye so I barbecue the steak and everything and, and again he loves it at the house and I'm, my wife makes a salad and everything and I cook, barbecue the steak and he cuts it in half and I said Zidano I'm like you're not gonna no no it's too much for me this guy is six foot nine <laughs> and the steak is this 14 ounce steak is too much for him but that he says he says, I'm okay. He says, I eat six, seven times a day. So he was going to eat when he goes back to the hotel, another snack. Uh, that's, that's how they, you know, and he's reading the labels. He's reading, counting the calories on the, on the dressing and stuff. Cause uh, you know, he's just, he's so fit. I mean, he's 42 years old and he's still playing. Well, I mean, the, uh, the career he's had, Dennis has been just unbelievable, yeah, he's right? An incredible human being. So I pick him up and it was a, it was a beautiful day one year and, and I had a little convertible in my garage. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to take that little convertible. I didn't put the top down, but I'm going to pick them up. So I go downtown and the light turns red. So I had to stop at the light. And I can see him coming down the sidewalk and he's on his phone. And he's talking on his cell phone. And he spots me in the car and he starts nodding his head on like, no, no, don't tell me. And I thought, oh, shit. And so I, the light turns green. I pop through the light and I pull over to the curb and I had my window down. I said, get in. He says, you're joking. I said, no, come on, get in. We got to go. He says, no, you must be joking. He says, at least put top down. I couldn't put the top down because it's manual and stuff. So I had to seat all the way back. So he squeezes into the car, his chin are right. His knees are right up to his chin and that. He says, hurry, drive. I don't want my teammates see me. <laughs> So we we laugh like hell about that, but yeah, he's just he's an incredible man. Oh, big man problems, complete opposite. That seeing you two must be uh, 
together must be quite comical, I bet. Yeah, no kidding. Like he just, you know, when you see little things like that, you must think to yourself like how uncomfortable it is. For, you know, he when he sleeps in a hotel room, he's got to sleep corner to corner, like diagonally. You know, and it's got to be a king size bed, otherwise he wouldn't fit. And yeah, just so I said to him, I said, "What do you do?" Like when he got in my car, I said, well, "What do you do for anything?" He said, "Well, I drive Lexus." He's got a Lexus four by four, but but they specially they take the front seat and they move and they literally bolt it back like they do for the basketball players and stuff. They they customize it. <laughs> so, Being tall isn't he, all it's cracked he, up to be. Yeah, he can afford a customized car. <laughs> Is he the tallest, the tallest guy you've ever uh, uh, hung around with, Dennis? I'd, oh, I'd... yeah. I think, he, I think he's the tallest uh, player to ever play at, at six foot nine. Yeah. Yeah. At six foot nine. Yeah. He's this, an absolute giant. Yeah, I played some rec hockey here in Calgary with uh, Mike Civic, the linesman. He, he was six seven. But uh, I think, was, I don't think anybody, I think there was another player at six foot eight, maybe, but I, I don't think anybody was over six nine. You know, back in your your playing days, um, you were, let's say, not afraid to drop the mitts every once in a while. What was the biggest guy you ever fought? The what? The tallest, the biggest guy you ever dropped the mitts with. Oh, I remember. I remember hanging on to Gilles Lupian one time with the Montreal Canadiens, and uh, and he he let me go. <laughs> he says, "Go pick, go pick somebody your own size." <laughs> I thought, "Oh, thank God!" But uh, yeah, Dave Schultz, uh, um, you know Don Seleski, you know all those guys were six two, you know six four. Uh, there was a lot of guys. Larry, Ro I never fought Larry Robinson, but you know Larry Robinson was big. Boucher was big at that time. There was a lot of guys who were six two, six three, six four, and then all of a sudden Bob Daly came. He was six five you know, for the flyers. And, uh, and now you see tons of guys that are six, seven, pray echo and go on and on. You were, um, you were taken in the 19, actually, no, before we get to the draft, I got to know in your first year in Flin Flon, you guys played Regina in the first round of playoffs. And if I read that correct, you guys lost three games to two with two ties. How is that possible? Honestly, I don't, I don't recall the setup. I do remember playing Regina in the playoffs and, and I remember playing Regina through the season because they had, they had Gillies, Wanchuk and Sobchuk. Uh, Dennis Sobchuk and obviously Clark Gillies and Wanchuk were a phenomenal line. But we were 19 and 20, you know, we were 18, 19, 20 years old. These kids were 16, 17, 18. They were just coming into there. They had Greg Jolly and, uh, you know, Bob Bourne. They had a, a tremendous team and, and we beat them in the playoffs uh, the one year because we were older. And then once we all graduated, then they ended up winning the Memorial Cup, um, the, the Pats. But yeah, I, I, uh, I, I played Dennis Sobchuk hard, hard, hard. And, uh, you know, I remember, and it's funny, I, I met him in Phoenix, in Arizona. He works on a golf course as a greenskeeper. Uh, lovely, lovely personality great guy and and we and when he spotted me we hugged it out and uh, it was uh, it was pretty incredible and then after we had some drinks together and stuff and I literally chased him off the ice uh, when we played junior and uh, you know like I said I was a little bit older than him but you know I did what I had to do we were trying to win I like how you say you played him hard 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 I'm wondering what back in the day defines hard I was vicious <laughs> and there's, there's no way that that you could play that style of game today um yeah i was vicious and and uh you know obviously you know people say it eventually caught up to me and stuff but i was tenacious i i played against all the other team's top lines marcel dion charlie simmer Renny robert uh you know Guy Lafleur, jacques lemaire steve shot um you know, that was my job to shut those guys down. And, and I, like I said, I was hard, at, hard on some of those guys. Who was, who was maybe the one line when they lined up against you, you went, man, I really hate playing these guys. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I remember I played against Gretzky in Edmonton and uh, 
Gretzky was just a young kid coming into the league. And he was, he was at the rink in the morning fixing up his sticks. So he was asking Lee Fogelin and, and Kevin Lowe and, and uh, Dave Semenko and that some of the veterans and that, you know, were playing against Detroit. You know, I know they're not very good. The record, you know, is not very good. But who do you think I'm going to play against? Like, is there anybody I need to want to look out for now? And Fogelin said, yeah, you're going to play against the Red Wings. And they got this little guy, number eight, Kalanich. Um, he's a tough little bastard, but don't worry. <laughs> don't worry about it. We'll look after it. So we start the game and Gretzky's starting the game and I'm starting the game. So the national anthem is over and I'm, I'm at center ice putting my helmet on and doing my strap up and Lee Fogland and Dave Semenko come skating through the center ice. And they said, Polo, you touched the great one tonight. You're dead. That's what they looked. That's what they looked up to. They thought, so I played. We played that night. And I think we lost five two or five three or something like that. Gretzky had like a goal and four assists. I thought I did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> was that was that their first game in the NHL? Uh, I don't know if it was the first game, but he was he, he was probably eighteen or nineteen years old. Just came from the WHA at the time, and then that was the early eighties. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So obviously, then you know his career what, became. What, I mean, now that you know everyone knows, you know the great one's career is the great one's career. But back then, what did you think of Wayne when you saw him step on the ice? Were you going, "This kid"? Exactly. That's it. Because he, he, you know, he was a hunched over skater. Um, you know, he, he honestly, and he had the Jofa helmet. Like he didn't look like a, you know, a Western Canadian, you know, hockey player. But boy, oh boy, when the puck dropped, like he, his hockey sense and his skills, you know, the way he could pass the puck and make plays were just uncanny. I mean, look at some of the guys he played with that scored, you know, Brett Callahan, um, um, you, you know, guys that, you know, were, were nothing. And they, had, they ended up playing with him and scored like, you know, 40, 50, 60 goals. Um, you know, I could have kicked him probably 30 or 40 with, with him as well. I'd like to yeah. think I could. I like to think I could have kicked in a couple as well with him. Yeah, no, he. Uh, you know, I'm just a consummate pro. Like you never hear, you you've never heard a bad thing about him, and you know he just he was so good for the game. You know, another, they, after, they, they certainly looked after him. Yeah, right? absolutely. Absolutely. You know, you mentioned you've dropped a couple different names of um, absolutely talented hockey players. One that. You know, I would have. I was a defenseman. Grew up uh, playing defense, and I've watched the Rock'em Sock'em videos of him. Uh, is Bobby Orr? You would have got to have known him. Uh, I, I got the tail end of Bobby the, Orr. The, the tail end. That's right. Yeah, I turned pro. The Bruins were the Bruins in the early seventies. Seventies. Yeah, turned, that's right. I turned pro in seventy three, and then I, you know, started playing in the NHL in seventy four, seventy five. You know, somewhere in there. Um, I played against him when he was with the Bruins and then I played against him when he was in Chicago, you know, and we couldn't all believe, you know, how that transpired, how that happened. And, uh, if you check the records, I believe that I have the last major penalty against Bobby Orr, um, when he was in, with Chicago, there was a, we were playing in the Detroit Olympia and, uh, it's a small oval shaped arena, the ice service. And uh, the puck went in the corner. So, of course, I'm, you know, trying to make a name for myself and, you know, get more ice time. So I run him in the corner and the puck goes behind the net and I run him again over on the other side. Well, the puck turned up the ice and we're jawing at each other behind the play, you know. And he's going, yeah, yeah, you're up from the miners trying to make a name for yourself. I said, I'm not impressed with your press clippings, you know, like, who are you? And, you know, I'm trash talking, <laughs> showing him no respect. Today I'd shine his shoes. <laughs> but, but anyways so we dropped the gloves and we get seven minutes each I thought well this is a great trade off his cover his, his cover is on the program that night so when we go to the penalty box the people are streaming down from the stands and sticking the program underneath the glass for him to sign his picture on the thing and I'm over on the other side still jawing at him and I'm thinking to myself oh my god I wish he could just sign one for me <laughs> So wait, you fought Bobby Orr? I scrapped with him 
that was part of my gig. Like if I could, if I could take Marcel Don, the on off the ice or yeah, absolutely. Or Guy Lafleur or, or, you know, Brian Trotche or, or Mike Bossy or, you know, somebody like that to come and sit in the penalty box with me for. It was a great minutes. trade-off. Yeah, it was a good trade. It was a good trade-off, you know, so that was part of my, uh, part of my gig. Yeah, but you still fought, you know, what are we talking here? The greatest defenseman of all time. Some people argue one of the best or the greatest players of all time. You dropped the mitts with Bobby Orr. I know. And I, and I broke Bob, I broke uh, Ray Bork's jaw one time too. I read that today. I, yeah. I, so you fought no. Ray and you fought Ray Bork when he was like a 20 year old. I was a bad little bugger. <laughs> I told you, I, I, uh, I wanted to win at all costs and I wanted to be there at all costs. Um, you know, it's just, uh, it's just one of those things. I guess that's what separated uh, me from others. You know, when you go back to 1973, the, the NHL entry draft, like today, the draft is um, such a big production, right? Everybody comes in. It, it's, it's, I mean, it, it is what it is now. It's, it's a big industry. It's a big moving machine. Yeah. Back in 73, when you get taken in the eighth round, I assume you're not at the draft. How do you hear about it? Who gives you the call? And, and what's your thoughts? Um, I, as I told you, we didn't have a phone on the farm. So, so I spent the day at my grandmother's house in Foam Lake and obviously sat by the wall phone waiting for the phone to ring. Um, I didn't have an agent. Uh, Patty Janelle, the coach, uh, I stayed in touch with him and, uh, and I stayed in touch with another person, Linus Westberg. He was a, a sports uh, announcer out of Yorkton, Saskatchewan. He was with CTV and he was, you know, they were getting it back in those days. Uh, there was no internet. So they were probably getting it on ticker tape or whatever you call it. And uh, so he was updating me, you know, with the draft. Um, I would call him or he would occasionally call me. And then uh, Patty Janelle called me. It was getting later in the draft. And he said, uh, Dennis, he says, I think Detroit's going to take you. He said, uh, uh, I, I'm not promising you, but he said, I just talked to them. And, because he was promoting me and said, you know, you can't go wrong. Much like uh, Calgary Flames took Theron Fleury with the last pick, you know, kind of thing. And I was taken uh, in the eighth round. Uh, and at that time, I think it was 116th or 118th overall. So today would be like the third or fourth round in today's draft. Um, but I, honestly, I didn't care um, who, where, or, you know, I got drafted. Obviously, I wanted to get drafted, but I just wanted a, an opportunity. I just wanted an invite to training camp. And the rest, I would look after myself. And lo and behold, an original 16, you know, chose me so you know, I just like, wow, like Gordy Howe, Alice Dovecchio, Ted Lindsay, you, you know, the storied franchise like that. It was just, it was numbing. And uh, so, you know what, when it happened, you just, I never had a personal trainer in my life. You start running a little further. You start lifting a few more weights and you start getting ready because, uh, you know, your, your window of opportunity is not that big. And uh, yeah, so when I went to Detroit, I... Uh, with my style, I, you know, they just kept asking, who is that little guy? Who is that little guy? Like, <laughs> look at him, like every day it was, you know, something, you know, I would do something that they would notice. Your first, uh, what was your first training camp like? Because, I mean, you end up going to uh, to Britain, all right? Like you, you end up being overseas that first year, but do you end up going to the first training or to a Red Wings training camp and... Yes, the, the, the London Lions were actually a part of the Detroit Red Wings or the Detroit Red Wings organization. Uh, back in those days, in today's society, in today's NHL, each team gets 50 contracts. So you have 22 or 24 NHL guys in Detroit, and then you got uh, another 22 guys in the minor leagues, you know, in the American League, and then you might have, you know, a couple of guys in Europe, you know, so you're only allowed 50 contracts. Back then in 73, 74, Detroit had 80 hockey players signed to contracts. So, so when you go to training camp, 
I know I'm not going to make Detroit because they got Alex Del Vecchio, Red Berenson, and Marcel Dion at center ice. I'm not naive. Okay, but I'm going to make an impression. <clears throat> so when we broke training camp, you know, because I was a young guy, a single guy, um, they were sending a team over to Europe. And I thought, my initial thought when they told me, I thought, oh, sc like, screw this. Like, I, I just signed a three-year contract, like an entry-level contract. I'm getting further away from the NHL than I am getting closer. Like, what's going on? But then once you talk to some guys and, and you know, find out what's going on, you know, I turned it into positive and say, wow, like I'm 19 years old. I didn't turn 20 till December 4th. I'm going to travel Europe, expenses paid, you know, and that's what happened. We played uh, 72 games there. Doug Barkley was a coach. Al Coates was the trainer and it was mostly single guys. I think we had three or four married guys on the team and uh, we just traveled around Europe and played exhibition games and tournaments. There was no league, but we played some good, like Spartak, Dynamo, you know, lots of good Czechoslovakian club teams, like against Vaklov, Nedomansky, Salming, Hedberg, Nielsen, you know, and then it was kind of ironic because a couple of years later, those guys started coming to the NHL. And that was the whole theory. They wanted to start a pro team, and they still talk about it to this day, this NHL teams going over there playing ex exhibition games. Um, so that's, that's how that evolved. Um, you know, called the London Lines. It was a, it was a line with a with a red wing coming out of the shoulder. It's kind of neat. I have a jersey downstairs, one of my original jerseys. What uh, <laughs> that is super cool. I I mean, when I read about it, and I read a uh, you know I read a couple different articles talking about the history of it and what they were trying to do, and you've summed it up quite nicely. When you look back at that year and you got to travel across Europe, are there some cool things that you got to do that stick out? Oh my God. Um, as I said, I, I, I got 7,500 signing bonus. And then I think I made, uh, you know, around 10,000 or something in the minors, you know, my minor league salary, but I didn't spend any money because they, you know, the accommodations were paid for meals were paid for. I didn't have a car, uh, and that, so I saved up a bit of money. So when I came back to North America, and came back to Saskatchewan. I didn't want to live with mom and dad on the farm in that two bedroom house. You know, I'm, sp I'm spreading my wings. So, so, I, so I bought a cottage at the lake for $8,000 and I paid cash for it. And I still have it today. And it's considerably more than more money. Yeah. No kidding. No kidding. Anyway, it was, you know, it was a, you know, as I said, you learn how to manage money, but uh, yeah, just traveling, you know, tr going to see, you know, whenever we had a day off, you know, we would explore, you know, go to Trafalgar Square, you know, we're here in London. I went to uh, a soccer game, you know, a hundred thousand people, you know, what I'd never seen a hundred thousand people in a stadium. I wasn't, I didn't go to Ann Arbor, Michigan, you know, to a football game, uh, you know, just things like that. I remember we were traveling and for Christmas, each player, the owner of the Detroit Red Wings, Bruce Norris, gave each player and staff a Rolex watch, an Oyster Perpetual Rolex watch engraved on the back, you know, London Lions, 73, 74, Dennis Blonich. You know, so I get the watch, I go to a tournament and I think I, it might've been the Ahern Cup, I ended up playing against Sob Chicken Gillies, Regina Pats brought their team over there. So anyways, we won the tournament and I won him most valuable player. So I get a, a, a caught Vance, a, Vacheron Constantine watch from the tournament. And they, when the guy gave it to me, he says, you, no sell, no sell, very expensive, very expensive. So I got that watch. Then I bought my mom and dad two watches, a, a Christmas gift, rattle watches. So now I got to bring them back across the border, back to North America. <laughs> so what do I do with them? I can't put them in my suit, in my coat pockets and everything. I got to go through customs. So I hit them in my hockey bag and my luggage and everything. <laughs> I think, oh my God, like, I hope they get, I hope they get to where I'm going. <laughs> so just, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, 19 years old traveling around Europe with a bunch of guys that you go to war with. Yeah, it was fun. Growing up, who was your favorite team in the NHL? Uh, Toronto Maple Leafs. You're a Maple Leafs fan. 
Yeah, we never had any TV, but I listened to Foster Hewitt religiously and Dave Keon was my idol. And uh, I, when I went to Flin Flon, I ended up wearing number 14. And uh, Dave Keon, when we played road hockey, I was Dave Keon. And uh, I would pretend I'd be carrying the puck and, and doing play by play. And Keon's got it over to, you know, so and so. And back like, to Keon. Oh! <laughs> you know, and, and uh, yeah, it's Toronto Maple Leafs. Do you remember the first time you played in the gardens then? Uh, yeah, I remember the first time I played in the gardens. I remember the first time I played in the forum. I remember the first time I played in Boston Garden, all the original six teams, because you grew up, you know, watching that stuff. You grew up idolizing. I, I got goosebumps. I would go there and just take it all in. It was just, it was, it was fascinating. And, and, you know, like, wow, I'm here. I'm here. I arrived. You know, when you uh, look back at it and you got to pull on the, the, the red wing Jersey for the first time, what, what night, what night was the best, not the best night, the most memorable night. Was it uh, the first night you get to pull on the Jersey? Uh, the first night you, you play maybe in something like Toronto, you know, your childhood team or your first goal, your first fight. What, what night in that first season really sticks out to you? There's, there's no real definitive, you know, they were all great. Try, you know, when I scored my first goal, when you played your first game at Montreal Forum, you know, or, or Toronto Maple Leaf Gardens, when I had my first interview in Hockey Night in Canada, um, the moment that sticks out for me the most is when I got called aside by the coach and the team and became captain. It was, it was pretty emotional. Just to have them okay. just, no, it's all, it's, it's all good, Dennis. Just to have somebody believe in you that much. Yeah. And, uh, and the responsibility that goes with it and your teammates, you know, voting, voting you that. Yeah. It's pretty special. Like I said, for an original six team, you know, and, uh, you know, I remember Alex or uh, Ted Lindsay came to my wedding in, in Foam Lake, Saskatchewan. You know, that's how much he thought of me. Uh, the general manager, the destroyed Red Wings, Hall of Famer, you know, flew from Windsor to Saskatoon, rented a car and came to Foam Lake, Saskatchewan for two days. I had like 13 teammates at the wedding. <laughs> so... Yes, just special times. You don't ask for that. You just, you earn, you earn it. And uh, I've had a good life, but I've earned it. I appreciate you sharing that. That's uh, anytime uh, your teammates think that highly of you is a special honor and you should hi hold that in high regard. Obviously you do. Yeah, yeah it does. And uh, like I said, you, you don't take, you don't take it for granted, but you don't think much of it. You know, when you're younger, you know, things are happening. But now when you sit back and, you know, you see your grandson or, you know, somebody with a Polaris jersey with a C on it, like, wow. So, anyways. You know, you bring up Ted Lindsay. Ted Lindsay is in hockey world. I mean... There's far, there isn't many bigger names than Ted Lindsay. You must have a Ted Lindsay story or two. Well, I just, like I said, uh, by him coming to the wedding just tells you what kind of a man he was and, uh, you know, what kind of a person he was. And then again, what he thought of me. So having said that, um, the night of my accident with Wilf Paymont, uh, October 25th, 1978, uh, when they took me to the hospital uh, in an ambulance and my wife came later, uh, who else shows up? Ted Lindsay. Um, you know, I couldn't talk. I couldn't see him. My eyes were swollen shut. But I remember him squeezing my hand uh, on the hospital bed. So, 
So, so yeah, so, uh, that's a, a tremendous Ted Lindsay story and he's a man of his word. And, you know, I, I wouldn't say I was a journeyman player if I had played, you know, I, I was every bit as good as Gary Howard or, or uh, Doug Jarvis or Doug Riseborough. But Gary Howard gets to play with New York Islanders and the other guys get to play with Montreal Canadiens. They won Stanley Cups. You know, I'm not, I'm not crying about spilled milk or anything, but, you know. Yeah, but you're, you're I'm, talking about... I'm just saying, I, I'm, you know, on par with those guys. But for him to come to the hospital uh, again, uh, you know, and, and, you know, he was there for me in, in you know, crucial time. He said he would look after me because I didn't know, you know, at that time, whether there'd be a, a lawsuit or, you know, what, where I would end up financially in that. He, when everything was, when I was all healed and I got back playing and everything, he signed me to a five-year one-way contract. That was the first time in my life I, had, I finally felt some security. When I played in Detroit, and I was captain of the Red, Red Wings in 76. I had 18 goals, 46 points, 278 minutes in penalties. I made 85,000 a year on a two, one year or two year contract. That's the way it was back then. You know, it was year to year, day to day. And, uh, you know, finally uh, I got my uh, one way contract, you know, guaranteed five years, like I said, it just finally could take a deep breath and say, you know, you knew where you were going to play the next year. Or if you didn't play, you knew you're still going to get paid. Cause then I, you know, I started a family, young kids. And... No, I, so, yeah. Appreciate, yeah. I appreciate you sharing that. One of, you know, on a, on a lighter side, maybe not a lighter side, we'll see here is I'd read that uh, back you're mentioning the Detroit Red Wings, um, not being the top of the league, shall we say, but the Philadelphia Flyers at one point were rate uh, one of the best teams in the NHL. And I read blood was shed every time they came into the old Olympia and you led the charge. Well, that was some of my best games and let's call a spade a spade. And when I, in the mid seventies, the red wings were called the dead wings. <laughs> You know, and, and I, I, I think we, I made the playoffs one year when I was there and uh, I was with Bobby Crom and, and we, we won, we beat Atlanta Flames in the playoffs in a three game series. And then we played against Montreal. Well, they lost 12 games all year. So we, we go to Montreal, we split. We thought, oh boy, like we got them right where we want them. They came to Detroit. They beat us like nine, one and, and eight, nothing. And I, I broke Ken Dryden's shutout with my only playoff goal. <laughs> but yes, uh, Detroit was, you know, and then all of a sudden, you know, and then they, there was a lot of turmoil. I had like 11 coaches in eight years and three or four different general managers, a couple of different owners who went from Bruce Norris to the Illich family. If I had played a few more years with the Illiches, they loved me, uh, you know, but they provided stability. And then Jimmy DeBellano came along and, and, uh, Drafted Steve Eiserman. You know, I remember him coming to training camp at 18. Um, uh, you know, I didn't play with him, but I was a training camp with him. But anyways, in the mid-70s, um, yeah, we were awful. But, but I made things interesting because Detroit was a blue-collar town. Um, you know, it was a motor city. That's where they built cars. A lot of, you know, blue-collar workers, and, and they loved blue-collar hockey players. And... You know, we had Bugsy Watson, Dennis Hextall, myself, you know, Dan Maloney. Um, you know, so I felt safe on the ice. I, you know, when things were dead, like I, I made sure something happened on the ice and made shout like Polo, 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 you know, uh, at, at the old Detroit Olympia. And, uh, and yeah, when we went to Boston and we went to Philadelphia, I got lots of ice time because nobody else wanted to play. So... <laughs> So, and uh, Broad Street Bullies, yeah. I Like I said, I played against the other team's top lines, and I'd, li I'd line up against Bobby Clark. Well, Bobby Clark would come off the ice, and out come Rick McLeish. I'd line up against Bill Barber. Off comes Bill Barber. Out comes uh, Dave Schultz. 
you know, so what do you think is going to happen? <laughs> He's not coming to wish me Merry Christmas. <laughs> so, so yeah, so they, uh, yeah, I used to, you know, they, a lot of times they were more interested in, in me than uh, the actual game. But it, uh, that was some of my best games because you played alert and you, you played, I played with two hands on my stick. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I think a, the broad street bullies are the broad street bullies for a reason. Uh, I think, I think it's a cool little news they, clipping they, that it, they, they were incredibly tough and you know what, they, they got two Stanley cups out of it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when they started dismantling the team, you know, then, you know, guys around the league started getting even with them, you know, with, you know, there were, there were some top guys like battle Bob, uh, uh, Bob Kelly and, and uh, like I said, uh, Dave Schultz and Moose DuPont and the Watson brothers and, you know, on and on. Um, but when they started dismantling the team, a lot of guys started getting even. And I remember playing against Dave Schultz when he was in Pittsburgh and Dave Schultz and Pittsburgh was coached by Johnny Wilson. And he's a Red Wing alumni who I had met many times and kind of looked up to. So he ended up coaching Pittsburgh. And there was a face-off in the Detroit Olympia <coughs> at the blue line, offside face-off, and I was playing right wing. Well, my back and my butt are right up against the Pittsburgh Penguins bench. And Dave Schultz is standing up on the bench. Pull on it, pull on, I'm gonna kill you. I'm gonna cut your eyes out. I'm gonna get even with you. I'm gonna do this. I turned around, just turned my head. I said, Schultzy. I said, how are you going to get even? You never get on the ice. Oh, my God. Johnny Wilson had to turn the other way. <laughs> Just, I could trash talk with lots with the of best them. of them. With the best of them. And then if I had to back it off, I backed it off. And, and a lot of people were a little bit leery fighting me because I was tough. But, you know, if they lost to a little guy, it was a bit of an embarrassment. So I tell you what, probably the funnest 40 minutes of my life uh, today was watching your old fights. Cause I, the entire time, all I'm thinking Dennis is like, this guy is my size going at it with some heavyweights in the NHL. Like this is friggin' cool. And I, uh, I love the commentators cause ah, pawn a chat it again. And then, and then you'd be getting thumped on and all of a sudden out of nowhere. And I suggest to any listener to look them up you come out with some absolute flying punches and it is awesome. Cause I'm just sitting there all over again, going, this guy is five, six going at it. Like, this is awesome. I can't I, I root for you. I, you'd be sitting in Chicago going, you may hate Blanich, but he's five, six out there go, giving it like, this is sweet. Yeah. I was, uh, I was a good teammate. You know, I guys knew that I had their back. I started it, but I, I'd be there if they started it as well. And yeah, it was fun. I, I was, I was tremendously strong. I worked out, uh, you know, religiously on the weights. I could bench press a lot. So I used to pull the guys in close and I could throw, I could fight with either hand. And like I said, I just, I bury myself and start throwing jackhammers. <laughs> <laughs> um, you got, uh, you came to Detroit after how's done. But Gordy does come back in the NHL. Did you ever run into any of those legendary elbows? Oh my God. I, I, as you said, when he, uh, I missed him by one year, he went to the, he ended up going to the WHA to, uh, Houston. That's right. And, yeah. And then they became Hartford Whalers. Well, when they became Hartford Whalers, he played in the all-star game in Detroit at Joe Louis arena. I, I believe it was 1980, 80 or 82. I think it was 1980. And my mother and father-in-law, were in <clears throat> Detroit from Saskatchewan, farmers. Jack is six foot something, worked the farm all his life, picked rocks by hand and stuff. So I had tickets through a doctor and the tickets included a VIP pass. So after the All-Star game, we got to go into a room and have drinks with the actual all-stars so I went up to Gordy Howe and I said Gordy he knew who I was and I knew who he was and obviously I worshiped the ground he walked on because he's from Saskatchewan I uh, 
I said, Gordy, I said, my father-in-law is here from Saskatchewan. <clears throat> I said, can you please say hi to him? Oh, yeah, yeah, no problem. Bring him over. So I said, Jack, come with me. You're going to meet Gordy Howe. Oh, great. So Jack, when he shakes your hand, it's like, oh, my God. Like, it's like a, putting it in a vice because he's a farmer. And Jack is, <coughs> sorry, six or four. Well, Gordy is no slouch either. So they shake hands and Gordy jumps back and he said, oh my God, how many milkers you got back home? <laughs> like how, how many cows do you milk? <laughs> so that broke the ice. Well, you know what? They talked for 15, 20 minutes. And till the day Jack died, it would warm my heart. He'd have friends over or whatever. And they'd be having a coffee or we'd have a Sunday dinner or something, a picnic or whatever and be out the side telling people how he got to meet Gordy Howe one time in Detroit. It was so heartwarming and that's Gordy. And then uh, we played, I played against him and you may not know this, but I'm in the Hockey Hall of Fame. Not as an inductee, <laughs> but my picture's in there. There's a picture from the press box. I took a face off against Gordy Howe when he, when he started the game with his two sons. They moved Marty up from defense and put him on right wing. And Mark, Mark, Mark was on left wing and Gordy was taking the face off. And I got to take the opening face off against him. Jean Anel was on my left side and Bill Hogebaum was on my right. I let him win the draw. <laughs> you got to line but, up against the Howes. The how Father and two sons playing in the NHL. That'll never happen again. And someone took a picture from the press box with the names on the back of the jerseys. So that picture is in the Hockey Hall of Fame. I have one better in my basement. It's all signed with all six guys. <laughs> oh, wow. I've, yeah, heard your, that, I've heard your basement is pretty dang impressive. I got a, a nice band cave. And uh, when, the, when the game was over, I happened to be on the ice. And the crowd is literally going crazy. They're just standing ovation and the buzzer goes. And I skated up to Gordy and I asked him for a stick and he reached, he reached back and handed it to me. So I got the last stick that Gordy Howe used at Joe Lewis Arena. That's pretty incredible. That's pretty incredible. Yeah. And then, and then obviously all the players, it was his time. So we all left the ice. We went to the benches and he skated around the ice and he took his glove and he took it by the string and he twirled it and he sent it up in the stands that center ice was incredible. And then he went, skated all the way around to the other side and he did the same thing on the other side, twirled his glove and flung it up in the crowd and the place just went nuts. It just, it was incredible. It was deafening. So can I then infer that in your time of playing Gordie Howe, Dennis Planich didn't turn into Polo, the guy who agitated the living crap out of everyone? Did you, did you try and do that with Gordie? No, not, not a chance. <laughs> he, he, he might have put me over his knee and spanked me. But no, there was just there was just ultimate respect. Ultimate respect to him. Ultimate respect. I mean, he's 40 at that time in his 40s or and just what he'd done for the game. And, and, and to be honest with you, I, I wasn't hard. Wayne Gretzky was just starting. I wasn't too hard on him, but I was, I was vicious on Marcel Dion, when he came back to Detroit to play, um, you know, Daryl Sittler, I remember, you know, because it was a rivalry, you know, between Detroit and, and the Leafs. I was hard on Sittler. Uh, not so much on Clark. I respected Clark. Clark was a bit of an idol for me because I, I played in Flin Flon and, and that's where him and Reggie Leach played five years before me. So I knew, you know, I knew the stories before, you know, his Philadelphia days. You know, I kind of, I respected him an awful lot. I still, I respect Marcel Dion to this day as well, but it was different when we played. I want to ask about uh, Steve Eiserman. Uh Steve Eisenman, um growing up, is my favorite player. He's like, I know you didn't get to play with him, but I know while you're in the organization, they draft him and he becomes, you know, it, it took him a few years, but he eventually becomes what everybody remembers as Steve Eiserman and, the ultimate leader and everything else. Well, there's a reason why those guys are leaders. They're born leaders. It's just, it's, that's the way they are. They're, they're genuine 
unbelievable people. And I'll give you two stories, Nick Lidstrom and Steve Eiserman. Steve Eiserman was 18 or 19 years old when he came to Detroit's training camp and then obviously went back to junior or, or I, was, I was gone to the minors or whatever. I never got to play with him. But in the Detroit locker room, in the weight room, they have a head and shoulder shot of all the ex-captains around the top of the thing. So they know who I am, even though I never played against them. And they respect that. So when they had, uh, when they were celebrating 100 years in the NHL, and they brought back, you know, all of us ex-captains and lined us up, you know, at center ice and introduced us to the crowd on the Jumbotron. Steve Eisenman came up to, to our car. We were sitting in the back of convertibles, came up to my car because it was close to where he was standing at the blue line. And he said, Polo, I just want to congratulate you. You know, awesome that they're doing this and welcome to Detroit. Enjoy your stay. Like he didn't have to do that, you know, but that's the kind of guy he was. Uh, you know, he, he knows that I bled, you know, red and white, just like he did. Nick Lidstrom, uh, when they came to Calgary, uh, a friend of mine that I play hockey with had a Nick Lidstrom jersey. He said, Polo, can you get this signed for me? I don't like to bother them, but of course I have access to them. <clears throat> so they let me walk right into the dressing room because I know Kenny Holland and, and the training staff and so forth. So I walk into the dressing room. And Nick Lidstrom is sitting right there. And I said, uh, Nick, Dennis Blonich, uh, would you mind signing for this? Would you mind signing this jersey for me? No, not at all, Mr. Mr. Polonich. Mr. Polonich. Come on in, make yourself, you know, make yourself, you know, what it, like, yeah, just, they know. And you know what? That's why they're captain. That's why they are, you know, superstars or elite people. Yeah. Um, there's a reason why he was captain for 20 years. Well, I don't want to keep you all night. We've been going for an hour. I know I'd said about an hour. Um, let's do the, the crude master final five, five quick questions for you. And then I'll let it get on, uh, let you get on with your night, Dennis. I really appreciate you uh, coming on and sharing some stories. Um, one, what's the best prank you ever saw pulled or pulled yourself while playing for the Red Wings? Uh, I have a couple and, uh, Alex Del Vecchio, he was our general manager and he was a meticulous guy, uh, you know, dressed to the nines, you know, hair always done. And he had white hair. So he would, we'd practice and he would sauna, you know, work out in the dressing room and sauna or whatever. And, you know, a couple occasionally he'd get caught, you know, a little bit late and we would be showering and, you know, hanging around the dressing room and that. Well, I filled up the hair blower with baby powder. <laughs> so, so, we, so when he went to dry his hair, he turned the baby, he turned the hair dryer on, he got this poof of baby powder all over his face, all over his head, and the guys were watching. <laughs> the polar, that's our general manager. Like. <laughs> another, another time, I hid in the stick bag. We emptied the stick bag and I crawled in the stick bag and I took my teeth out and I was just in there with my hockey underwear and Joe Koser and Igor Larionov were in on the joke and they sent one of the guys, he said, I don't have time, I don't have time. Can you go to the stick bag and get grab my sticks for me? So the guy bends down to unzip the stick bag and I jumped out of the stick bag and stick <laughs> And the whole room just fucking, it was hilarious. Yeah, just a lot of stupid shit like that. I nailed the guy's cowboy boots one time with uh, little finishing nails, nailed them down to the bench and couldn't get them off there. <laughs> you know, we used to tie, we used to tie the $10 bill on a string at the airport because we all flew commercial back then. It was all, you know, it was not charter. So we had time to kill. So we dragged the $10 bill around and, yeah, it was. Did you ever remove the doors off a guy's vehicle? By the name of Eddie Jockman? <laughs> <laughs> he had he had a Jeep. It was called, it was literally called The Thing. That, that's what they called it, The Thing. And it was a summer vehicle. I don't know why he had it in Detroit, but he had a summer. So he brought it to practice one day. And it was blistery, cold, and windy. It was awful weather. 
and the doors, you could just pull the doors off and roll back the canvas on the hood or whatever. Well, we did all that, but we didn't leave him the doors. We put the doors <laughs> in the trunk of my car. <laughs> and took the doors home with you. Yeah, we took the doors home. And I ended up setting him up against his garage because we beat him home. <laughs> he couldn't travel more than 30, 40 miles an hour. He, he didn't have a tooth. He had, he had a hockey sock on his head because <laughs> he was freezing. <laughs> and we passed him on the highway. We were waving to him on the, on the, on the expressway. And oh, my God. He didn't, want to leave his, he didn't want to leave his car down at the lock. <laughs> not at the Olympia in downtown Detroit. He'd come back and you wouldn't have any wheels left. Oh, man. So, yeah, we did a lot of, a lot of crazy things. I, I, I had another good joke, too. Uh, Dennis Hextel and Terry Harper were really good hunters, and they, they went up in northern Michigan hunting all the time. And So I bought three duck calls, and I passed them around in the dressing room. So when we'd be on road trips at the airport or in a hotel, you know, you'd hide around the corner and you'd do this duck call. And so it took them two or three months. They, they were totally convinced that I had one, that it was me, but I never, I passed them out among the team. Well, they caught one guy and then they caught another guy. And so then, you're in the, you're in the airport and all of a sudden there's a duck call going off. Yeah. And everybody's looking around. Holy shit. Well, like, is there a duck in here? <laughs> like, and we stayed in a hotel in Chicago where it was all open up to the top and they were on like the ninth floor and I was down in the restaurant in the lobby and I was hiding behind a tree and I was doing this duck call and people thought there was ducks in the hotel flying around and so anyways we had a party there was one duck call out so we had a party and they were totally convinced that I had it so one of the guys were going home early so I said take this duck call when you when you get home I want you to call this residence and give them the duck, ask for Dennis Hextall and give him the duck call over the phone. So he went home, he dials the, the residence. I made sure that I was sitting right beside Dennis Hextall. He said, Dennis Hextall, telephone. So he goes to the call and all I could hear is quack, quack, quack. And he looks directly at me. Okay, it's not you. He raced upstairs. He thought it was somebody up in the, upstairs on the on the extension on another telephone oh my god so that went on for that went on we had so much fun with that for months you know i ask everybody who comes on uh with me if they could do this with one person so essentially pick the brain of of uh of anyone who would they take so who would you take if you could sit across from somebody and and sit and pick their brain you know what i had the pleasure of meeting some of these guys john winsink you know, he always, you know, he was an interesting character when he played, you know, Stan Jonathan, uh, Dave Schultz. I met him, you know, and Bob Kelly at, uh, at a, a golf tournament. And we just, you know, busted out laughing and had a great time, a great thing. So, you know what? Sometimes when you see these guys on the ice, their character on the ice, they're totally different off the ice. If people judged me, just by the way I played and my character on the ice, they think I was a real asshole. Well, you know what? <laughs> I'm not. So yeah, it, it, it surprises you. Um, you know, and, and you know what? At the end of the day, they're ordinary people. Bobby Orr is an ordinary person. Wayne Gretzky is an ordinary person. They're human beings. Steve yeah. Eisen, Nick yep. Lidstrom. Yeah. That's actually, that's probably one of the coolest things about doing this is uh, you see that all the time. You, you get to talk to really, uh, uh, I don't know, high profile people, I guess would be the right terminology. And they're just, you sit and it's, it's enjoyable just to sit and converse and share some yeah. stories. You know, and I taught my kids that and I'm teaching my grandkids that you don't put yourself above anybody. Um, you are what you are. Be nice, be kind to people. Um, I can vouch for that. My son-in-law is black. Uh, and they live in Arizona, and this has been a tough time for everyone. They get they get three beautiful, beautiful children, and and uh, yeah, and we work with them every day, not to get pushed around, not to be bullied. Be kind, you know. Everybody's equal. That type of thing. We got to get our heads out of the sand. Yeah. So absolutely. 
If you were traded from Detroit and could bring one guy, who would you bring with you? Who would have you brought with you? Oh, boy. Probably Dennis Hextall. Dan Maloney, Dennis Hextall. Um, Brian Watson, you know, Bugsy Watson. Just guys that you... If I'm walking down a back alley... They got your back. And it's dark outside, and I'm confronted... Those are the guys I want with me. How about this? And, and, you, and, 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 that, and you know what? They would probably say the same for me. If you were lining up, you're at center, and you could pick your wingers, any wingers. It doesn't have to be on Detroit. It could be any wingers you want to have with you. What two guys would you toss on a line with you? Who's playing with Polonic tonight? I, we had a, a tremendous line. Walt McKechnie scored 82 points, was best year in the NHL. Dan Maloney, 67 points, and, and myself. And we could play any way you wanted to play against anybody. We had skill. We had grit. We had, we had everything. Uh, those are the kind of line mates I need or, or I'd want. I obviously want a, a, you know, at least one guy with skill, but I want the other. I want some toughness there, too, and some compete. Your, some final, your, your final one. If you could give one piece of advice, and you've probably done this an awful lot through your life, to up-and-coming hockey players or people in general, what piece of advice would you pass along? Obviously, learn how to work. No excuses. Uh, you know, don't compare yourself to others. Uh, you know, I know it's, it's a little bit more than one, but there's probably five things that I would ingrain, you know, not only into my kids, but kids that I coached and that, getting them ready for real life. It's not easy out there, man. And, you know, learn to do things for yourself. You know, quit pointing fingers, no excuses. And just roll up your socks and, and, and get you know to what? Work. And get to work. And you know what else? Deal with shit. You know, shit's going to happen. You got to deal with it. Well, I think it's awesome. I really do appreciate you hopping on, Dennis. And, uh, I've really, really enjoyed this, and nice getting to meet you, and I appreciate you hopping on, so thanks again. Thanks, Sean. Thanks for having me. Hey, folks. Thanks again for joining us today. If you just stumble on the show and like what you hear, please click subscribe. Remember, every Monday and Wednesday, a new guest will be sitting down to share their story. The Sean Newman Podcast is available for free on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, and wherever else you find your podcast fix. Until next time.